Welcome to tutorial 3 on Microsoft Project. Today we're going to look at maneuvering around in Microsoft Project. If you review tutorial 1, you got a general overview of Microsoft Project and how activities link to each other, uh, how the critical path is shown and indicated. If you looked at uh, tutorial 2, you would have seen how the calendar works. There would have been a bit of a review from tutorial uh, one and the calendar function does a lot as far as instituting holidays. Uh, today I just want to get you familiar with maneuvering around to the different screens which is probably one of the most difficult things to do and get used to when using scheduling software. As I mentioned in the introduction Microsoft Project works a lot like a database program so there are a lot of different tables and screens and it can get very confusing as to which table or screen that you're in. Although you can customize the screens, you can insert columns, uh, predefined columns that I went over in tutorial 2. Uh, often you just want to switch to a different screen to review information that's already there. When you put the information in to Microsoft Project, then it records it and it can be viewed in a multitude of ways and different tables will communicate with each other as well. So there will be different tables that actually communicate with each other as well. Uh, that's how a database program works. It really uh, common, common uh, fields between, so there could be basically what we call a primary key. One field can communicate to another field in the different tables and views. So in this particular project that I've just got up on the screen, it's got a bunch, of, it has a bunch of information already added to it. And so that way, at least you can see some things when I go to the different screens. It doesn't have everything, so it doesn't have updates and things like that. But as far as being a baseline schedule, it's got the data in, it's got activities and resources, which we're going to review uh, in, in an upcoming tutorial as well, uh, how to add resources, create resources. One of the things I find is uh, Microsoft Project lets you do things, any one thing you can do about four or five different ways. It can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. In fact, I always learn from different people I work with uh, new ways of doing things. And sometimes I'd say, well, that takes longer than the way I do, or other times I, it's a revelation that this is great. Now, I never thought that you could do that. So one of the ways that you can switch screens and they don't all, there's several locations to get to certain screens. So they're not all housed necessarily in one spot. Uh, you can go to this top left corner here where it says Gantt chart and you could go between the Gantt chart and the tracking Gantt. You can see here there's more views and there's a whole listing of different uh, views and screens that you can, and tables. Microsoft Project tends to call them tables and sheets and diagrams. So there's no one consistent name for the different views uh, and you can see a, a long list there. I don't do that too much unless I'm after some specialty view that's not sort of uh, one of the more normal views. Usually what two places that I go is I call this the square icon box over here. I don't know that there's a particular name for it but I found that uh, it's a quite a useful spot. So that little square icon box, when you click it, as I said in tutorial two, it selects everything. But also if you right click uh, on your one of your mouse buttons, you'll see a, a, a pull down menu comes up and you'll see here it's got a cost, entry, hyperlink, schedule, summary, tracking, usage, variance, work, and then more tables too. You can go through a whole list of uh, tables. When we get more advanced, you can get into earned value analysis and different uh, points of information that can also be brought up. You'll find that the most common ones are on the first list, though. Uh, the cost screen is quite useful if you are reviewing costs, and we'll look at that again in another tutorial. If you've applied resources and you've applied costs, you can see the costs uh, on the screen. You can also see uh, any variances. Uh, this particular project uh, has not yet been saved as a baseline or set as a baseline. Uh, once it would be, then any changes that we would make would show up as variances. So something that didn't come out to the plan, it would show as a variance, which is fundamentally why you want to use a scheduling software so you can develop a plan and then compare the plan to what's actually happening. And so that's uh, the way that most scheduling software uh, works in, in that way. 
So we have uh, our cost screen as an example. We ha and I'm just gonna go over the ones that I think are the most pertinent for now. Uh, we'll cover other ones in other tutorials, but here you see the schedule screen. So usually if you're just learning how scheduling software works, this can be quite useful because this has what we call the start and finish, also known from critical path terminology as the early start and early finish, and late start and late finish. And so to calculate the critical path, there's an algorithm and there's what we call a forward pass and a backward pass. And you can do this manually. In fact, I'll, on my YouTube channel, I'll have uh, another tutorial very shortly on showing how the, how the critical path is actually calculated manually. And I think it's really important if you're gonna be a project manager that you understand that. Uh, because if you really understand that, then you understand the importance of putting the right linkages, putting the right durations to make sure that your project schedule is accurate. Scheduling software is only as good as the information you put into it. And it's very much like estimating software. If you make a mistake and you don't catch it, it could be literally throwing your project off months or hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're doing a cost loaded schedule. But if you put it in right, it does all these calculations for you. And you'll notice here there's the uh, total slack. Well, total slack in Microsoft Project is the same as saying float, total float. So if there's any Primavera users that are looking at this, uh, then you'll be familiar with it saying total float. Microsoft Project says slack. Total slack, total float, they mean the same thing. How much flexibility you have in this activity. And if you have no flexibility, it'll show zero days. Zero days means no flexibility. Uh, in the activity level, down from the work breakdown structure listing here, uh, if it says like two days as in this example, that means this activity could take two days longer without uh, in basically along the stream. This activity or this activity or any one of these ones here could take up to two working days longer without changing the finish date, All right? Any ones that have zero, as soon as I change a duration on it, my project will take longer. That's why it's indicated in red for the critical path. So the schedule screen is really like the critical path screen in that it shows you uh, where the float is and uh, how what your early start, early finish, late start, late finish uh, dates are. So another screen that we have available is uh, the that's very commonly used is the tracking screen. Now the tracking screen, as you'll see in a later tutorial when we do updating, is where we put our actual dates. This is another area where new users to Microsoft Project have a lot of trouble. There's so, much diff there's so many different start columns and finish columns, and they usually have a first heading. Like I was just in the schedule view, right? And it shows start, finish. Well, that's fairly regular. That's the plan, late start, and it means the same as early start and early finish always in these cases. Late start, late finish. Well, there's another two column names. And now over here in the tracking view, I've just added actual start and actual finish. Well, actual start and actual finish is pretty much what it says. When did we actually start this activity? So now instead of planning, we're actually doing. That's the difference. One is planning and one is uh, doing. So you only fill this out when you're act actually updating the schedule. Stuff has happened. So this is really looking at what has happened and putting in actual time frames for the work that's been going on. Very important screen. Uh, it's one of the main functions of using scheduling software because the only reason we develop a plan is then we can compare what's actually happening to uh, what we planned and see the variances, which brings up the next most important screen, which is the variance screen. In the variant screen, this would be filled in with uh, my baseline dates once I set the baseline, because what Microsoft Project does is it takes a snapshot of the plan, it puts it here, and then when the plan changes, it, it compares the changes and what was the plan to the variances. So now we've got baseline start and baseline finish, which is again different than just start and finish. Uh, and that will give us variance. And variance is just another way of saying the difference, the difference between the plan and what's actually happening. So it will always then show us what those differences are, which then helps us if we need, when we see that we're falling on off track, then we can start determining, okay, what do we have to do to get the project back on track? It's very helpful scheduling software that you have a plan 
Then you measure where you are. And then once you see where you are, the next step is, well, how do we get back on track? What do we got to do? Do we have to work weekends? Do we have to bring in more resources? Or do we have to tell the client the project's going to be delayed? Uh, at least you have that information and it's accurate information once you've updated to then start figuring out what you want to, how you want to proceed on your project. So those are probably the most important ones for us to look at. Now we'll look at work and we'll look at usage in, a, in another uh another tutorial like work and usage is really just putting hours of work that we uh, put in uh, and same idea with uh, oh that's usage and work uh, so again we've got our uh, work and what was our baseline if we set the baseline it would have the hours we'd see the variance not only in time frames but in hours of work and that will work on uh, resources that we've applied as uh, work instead of you know like a subcontractor where it might be based on cost where if we want to see variance in cost we look at the cost screen so the square icon box is one excellent place to go to find information on uh, the different screens cost uh, entry schedule entry is our starting point by the way entry is where you typically open your microsoft project file and it's where you typically develop your schedules and put in uh, your entry level information. So that one's kind of uh, describes what it does. The other place that I use quite frequently uh, to find where I'm at, and again, you could use some of these to do this. See, it says network diagram. That's going to be one of the ones that would take me there. It says more views. Again, I could use that. Uh, but the where the place I usually just do, it, it, I find it's the easiest, is I just slide my mouse to, all the way to the left of the screen. So I'm over this area that says Gantt chart and I right click either one of the tabs on my light laptop or on my mouse and I uh, slide over and you'll see a whole series of screens here. So you'll see a calendar screen, you'll see a network diagram, task form, task usage, task uh, uh, timeline, tracking Gantt. Tracking Gantt is another, another fundamentally important screen that we'll talk about in other tutorials. It's used for updates, updating of uh, our projects. And it'll show bars that'll show uh, the bars split. One bar on the bottom to show what was the plan and one bar on the top to show how they're proceeding. If you're behind or ahead, it'll show plus or minus on it. We'll get into that in another tutorial, as I said. Resource form, resource graphs, resource sheets. We'll do a tutorial on that. And the resource sheet is based, is where we actually put our resources and we describe what type of resource we want to put. And if we're doing resources with work, meaning that maybe they uh, we self-perform the work or maybe for our admin staff, then we would load those resources onto our uh resource sheet and we would apply costs like whatever the hour the burdened hourly rate of uh, these particular people burden means it's got all of their costs the cost you're paying them uh, your uh, wsib or whatever safety compensation that your state or province maybe requires you to pay uh, government taxes withholdings and a number of other factors that add on to that so you put your, your rates and your hourly rates. And when you apply them, it will calculate how much. So if you, you know, if you have a superintendent that's going to work 40 hours in a week and it's at $75 an hour, it will calculate what that total is for you automatically. The other ones that are listed as cost really are there as uh, these would be subcontractors where you have procured them and you based it on a subcontractor rate. Uh, so you'd have uh, those listed in uh, that way. So depending on how you want to manage it, and there's even a material one that we'll talk about when we talk about resources, if you wanted to measure stuff like cubic meters of concrete or square foot of ceramic tile, anything that's uh, measured by perimeters, areas, cubic feet, uh, cubic meters, cubic yards, uh, you could put in there. So I'm going to slide again to the left and I'm going to right click. There's also just for those of you that have trouble remembering, you know, where these are, maybe that you find that cumbersome. There's what we call a view bar. You can slide down to the bottom and it actually puts a little toolbar down the side. So if you want to get at any of those uh, that I just had from the list, they're actually already there. You see calendar, Gantt chart, network diagram. It follows that form all the way down. So the view bar is there. If you don't want the view bar, you can get rid of it. So if you want it, you just right click 
view bar and then you don't have to keep right clicking to look for stuff it's up to you this does take a little bit of your screen space though so sometimes people want to get as much of the gantt chart information shown as possible there's also the network diagram which is very helpful this is showing you the overall connections of all of your activities so I can zoom this uh, to be larger if I want to. I can slide down. This My picture might be in the way at the bottom right corner, but on the bottom right corner of your screen, you would see a plus and a minus uh, symbol that would uh, be allowed to scale in or scale out. And if I keep you know, scaling inward, I can see these are all uh, my uh, activities and headings. These parallelograms, this shape, funny shape here, those are part of the work breakdown structure and their headings. This activity that's got a point on both sides, that's a milestone. Remember, a milestone has zero duration. If you're not sure, go back to tutorials uh, one and two and you'll get more information on that. Apply for permits, that's your activity level. So that's at the lowest level of the work breakdown structure. So that's at your activity level. Uh, apply for uh, permits. And as you notice, none of the parallelograms are connected. And that's the way it should be. Best practice is not to connect headings to activities. But all of the activities, if you scroll along, you'll see they are all actually, and I'll scroll out just going behind my picture here and making it smaller so you can see things uh, more easily. You see as I scroll along here, I'll pull this up. All of these activities, they're all connected. They're all connected. And from tutorial one and two, we know that we don't want to have any open ends. Open end is when one activity is not connected. It could mean that your critical path is not correct. If you haven't properly uh, done the uh, schedule logic, what happens before what, then that would be a problem. So this is a great place to also review it, does this make sense for me? Is this how I want to run my project? Do I want to have uh, the drain roughing connection done at the same time as the water supply, as the electrical service, right? So you can make, uh, you can ask yourself questions as you're reviewing it. You could zoom it out a little bit or zoom it in so you could read it and just sort of walk yourself through the project step by step this in this manner. I find it very helpful to walk through it because I I've, I've, may have laid it out in this format and I can walk through it and I can go frontwards and backwards with it this way, but I also like another way of reviewing the material. And the network diagram is not linear. So in other words, it has nothing to do with, you know, how long this line is between there and there, none of that. It's just the activities. You can look in the activities and see how long they are and the information in it. It's more about the logic, when something is happening in comparison to other activities and does this make sense. So it's a good way of double checking the Gantt chart information, which is linear. This really is linear. If this is you know that much longer than one of these, it's proportionate to the difference in durations. So keep that in mind as well. And it's helpful that you don't miss anything that way, uh, like open ends. It's also the calendar view up here. And there's some people that uh, they, uh, they have trouble reading a schedule. It, it just really is difficult for them. I find that uh, a number of employees I would have difficulty with in that way. And so, to be honest, uh, I would, uh, with those particular employees, very often I would print out a, the schedule in a calendar format, what's coming up in the next month. Or I would take a screenshot and I would send them what's coming up in the next month. So you could see in this particular case, this is what's happening this particular week in July coming up. This is what's happening the following week. We've got multiple activities going on at the same time. And so you get a, a, you get a sense then how things are actually uh, coming up on your project from a calendar basis. And you can do all kinds of uh, different things with this in the sense that you can customize it. And you can say uh, number of weeks, four weeks, just show me three weeks. So imagine if you're doing a three-week look ahead, you could just print out the next three weeks. 
and show what is coming up in the next uh, three weeks. You could also, if you're in the view uh, tab, you could also filter this information by resource. So you could also filter it by a date range. You could say, you could say the date that you want to have. Show me tasks that start uh, or finish after, let's say, um, May 18th. Click OK, and then it's going to show you when you want them done. So I'm going to pick, I picked May 18th. So I'm going to go and say uh, June 8th. I'm going to click OK. And it didn't show me anything there. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe I picked the wrong year. Let's try that again uh, on the view. Date range, cancel. Uh, date range, probably picked... Uh, date range yeah that's why it picked the wrong year so you got to be in the right year that's always helpful uh, to know that so let's see I'm gonna pick uh, May 17th click OK 2021 in this particular case and I'm going to uh, go back up to uh, here and I'm gonna pick uh, May 17th let's go one more week oh, let's go there okay so we've got May 31st and now it's just showing me that work that's coming up in those three weeks which would be great so if I'm doing a three-week look ahead I could filter the information printed off this is what's coming up and have my discussions with the various trades on that on a larger project of course it would be a lot more uh, complex and a lot more things going on but regardless we can customize how we show and filter this information using the filtering tools over here and using some of the custom uh, screen tools over here. So there's a lot of different things we could do. We could even filter this to indicate uh, just one particular trade. So you could filter it to say using a particular resource. What resource? Because all the resources would be listed over here that you've applied to this project. And then you could pick whichever one that you want. So filtering tool is very, very helpful that way. The only thing I would uh, suggest if you do filter something here, try to remember that you did filter it because otherwise you might wonder, where did everything else go? Where did it go, right? So uh, no filter ensures that you've got everything back to normal. You always have to concern yourself with doing something and then forgetting about it and then you're not seeing all the information and getting all uh, nervous about it. I think that's one of the things I find with new users to scheduling software. They do something, they forget they've done it and then it's hard for them to uh, remember what it is. So just be careful about that, especially if you're a new user. Uh, so that would be uh, that, the calendar view. Uh, and as I said, there's a whole array of other views. Tracking view, it's not going to show me much in our, our tracking view right now because we don't have a baseline set. It's just going to show me a single bar. But if we had this set as a baseline, we'd see another bar underneath here that would represent the baseline. If there's a difference between the bars, then you'll see it. We'll discuss that in an upcoming tutorial, though. So uh, the other the other ones that you see here are resource based. And as I said earlier, we just go to the resource sheet. This is where all that resource information is put in. So as a basic concept, I would try to remember that there's two places that we can uh, switch between our screens. I would try to also remember if I want to get back to normal, I want to go to the Gantt chart. And if I want to assure I'm in the entry view, I can click on that square icon box and just make sure I'm in the entry view. Uh, entry view would have duration, start, finish, predecessors, and resource names as a default starting area. In this particular example here, I've got the WBS column inserted. I would have earlier inserted the column. So by clicking any column, I could have right clicked and went to insert column. If I type the W, that'll bring up WBS and there it inserts into it. So as I discussed in one of the earlier tutorials, you can customize your columns. Now this has just got the two of them side by side. There's no logical reason why you would do that. But the good thing is about Microsoft Project, you can just delete a column and it deletes it from view. Uh, you can always bring it back. It's not like deleting a column from Excel when it's gone. The other column that I don't have up here, which I normally like to have up in the screen, is the indicator column. And you probably have it on your screen. So you just right click, you go insert column, press I for indicator if you don't have it. 
and that's this one here. And this is a very useful column as it will show if you've done anything peculiar to any of the activities like added a custom calendar or added a constraint or added a note. It will show that in the indicator column. So I usually use that as a troubleshooting tool to see if there's any problems going on or anything special happening to any of the activities. Okay, so I think, you know, as far as to recap, uh, the, the main things that I wanted to emphasize, it's difficult in the beginning to understand which screen you're in. So the more you switch between screens, the more comfortable you'll come with that. And to switch two ways that I suggest, click the square icon box, right click, you see these series of screens. The most important ones I would say once we get started is entry screen, the schedule screen, the cost screen. If we're adding cost to a schedule, we don't always add cost to a schedule if we are. Uh, the cost screen, the tracking screen where we do our updates, actual inputs, and the variance screen where we see the differences are. And all of these we're going to get into a lot more detail in upcoming uh, tutorials. So hopefully that's helping you that way with that screen. And the other way to switch screens is right click, slide your mouse all the way to the left, right click. I put in the view bar. I'm going to take it out now. So you can slide to the left, right click, and you've got your list of screens here, different screens than is that by the square icon box, by the way. And if you want the table, uh, the the uh, pull down menu the, with the icons on it, you can click view bar and it will bring them up and you can leave them or not. That's up to you. Okay, so I hope everybody enjoyed this tutorial and please subscribe to my YouTube channel, which the subscribe button is just below and that way you'll uh, be able to uh, watch more of the updates as they come as they come in in future. But my name's Tom Stevenson and goodbye for now. Have a great day.